Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Time to take a look at some of the most interesting stories coming out of CES 2020. And of course, we already covered all of the AMD related news yesterday, and they certainly had the most news, I guess, out of the big three companies at the show. But Intel and Nvidia also had some cool things, so we'll talk about those in a moment. Like with yesterday's video, we're not actually on the CES show for, so don't expect any hands-on stuff from us. We're just taking a chill this year and staying home in Australia. But with so much news floating around at this time, I always find recaps useful. So here's 10 to 15 minutes worth of cool stuff to look forward to throughout 2020. First up, let's wrap up some odds and ends from yesterday's AMD news. A Q&A series with CEO Lisa Su has been posted by the wonderful folks at Anantech that answers some of the major questions surrounding yesterday's announcements. Not going to go over everything here. You should definitely check out the full Q&A on Anantech in the links below if you want information about absolutely everything. But I'll tackle the big questions here. It seems that a lot of people were expecting a bit more information at yesterday's keynote about AMD's upcoming products, so stuff beyond just the RX 5600 XT and Ryzen Mobile. There were essentially three products that AMD didn't talk about. There's Zen 3, Big Navi, and the desktop APU. So let's tackle each of those. On Zen 3, Lisa Su said that people should expect them to be very aggressive with the CPU roadmap and that we will see Zen 3 in 2020. She said Zen 3 is also doing really well and that they are pleased about it. And that's really all she was willing to say. Now, Zen 3 coming in 2020 isn't that much of a surprise to anyone as it's been firmly planted in 2020 on AMD's roadmap for a while now. But in case you needed further confirmation, well, there it is. The reason why AMD didn't show Zen 3 at the show, well, we don't know the definite reasons, but I have a few guesses here just in case you were wondering. Firstly, when companies are making major product launches in a particular category like CPUs and Ryzen Mobile getting upgraded to Zen 2 with the new APU design is definitely a major launch. They tend to not want to overshadow that launch with talk of future products on a next generation architecture. And with Zen 3 probably still some time away, I mean, let's not forget that the first consumer Zen 2 products launched in July of 2019, there are still plenty of major shows left in the calendar where they can talk Zen 3, Computex being one of them, which would sound right if AMD were going to launch Zen 3 at least 12 months after Zen 2. We don't know if they will show anything at Computex, but CES seems quite early. Of course, AMD did show off Zen 2 at CES last year, albeit briefly, but they didn't have other major CPU launches at that show. And this year, AMD only had 45 minutes of time for their event, so adding anything to the already jam-packed show is going to be pretty tricky. What about a high-end Navi GPU, otherwise known as Big Navi? Well, Lisa Su said that we should expect that we will have a high-end Navi and that it is important to have it, but didn't elaborate much further, saying she didn't comment on unannounced products. So nothing really groundbreaking there, aside from saying that Big Navi will happen at some point. What we have been hearing from people in the industry for a little while now is that Big Navi is not coming soon and likely won't be using first-gen RDNA. Instead, it sounds like AMD will wait for their second gen design to be ready, possibly that's RDNA 2, and launch a high-end competitor with that architecture, which is expected to be a bit more power efficient and better suited for a flagship part. A lot of the work that they've been doing for the Xbox Series X GPU will tie in here as well. That GPU is expected to be quite large and pack stuff like hardware accelerated ray tracing thanks to a refreshed architecture. It seems the guys at Video Cards have been hearing similar things. They've flagged June or July as a possible time. We'll hear about Big Navi. No idea whether that's that's correct, but there are two big shows around that time in Computex and E3, so that would make a bit of sense. What about desktop APUs? This was the surprise omission from the show. We expected AMD to announce both mobile and desktop Zen 2 APUs, but we only ended up seeing Ryzen Mobile. But desktop APUs do exist, they are coming, and Lisa Su says we should expect a lot more from AMD. But it's only January, so there's plenty of time to launch desktop APUs later, with AMD telling us the focus of this show was mobile parts. A couple of other interesting notes from the Q&A. Lisa Su did confirm that Navi will come to an APU design at some point, but the focus of the new APUs has always been using a refined version of Vega on 7 nanometer. We did see some discussion in our Discord chat yesterday about how AMD were able to achieve greater than a 50% performance improvement when bringing Vega to 7 nanometer for this part. Lisa Su did comment saying that a lot of that has come from what they learned power optimizing the architecture in the shift to 7 nanometer. So it does 
doesn't sound like this is a simple die shrink, but rather at least somewhat of an architectural improvement, although she didn't go into detail on that. Plenty of other questions were asked and answered in the Q&A. Again, if you're interested in what AMD is doing right now, well worth a read in the links below. Let's shift gears now to talk about Intel. The other big CPU manufacturer didn't have as much to show at CES 2020, but we did get some teasers for upcoming products. We'll start here with Comet Lake because I think some people were expecting a bigger reveal of high performance 10th generation parts at the show, including Comet Lake S. But what we actually got was nothing at all on Comet Lake S and a bit on Comet Lake H. The stuff Intel shared on Comet Lake H is minimal. It seems that the Core i7 lineup will reach five gigahertz for the first first time, so the six core models which currently top out at a 4.6 gigahertz turbo will receive a bit of a clock speed boost. Intel also says to expect higher clocks on the eight core Core i9 parts. Some of these parts already hit five gigahertz, so it'll be interesting to see how much further they go. No mention here of 10 core parts. It sounds like Intel is still sticking with eight core for 45 watt mobile chips, although 10 core is expected on the desktop. Of course, as these are Comet Lake processors, they will still be built using a refined 14 nanometer node as 10 nanometer isn't ready for the sorts of clock speeds required for high performance CPUs. And while Intel is trying to hype up these parts on the slides, it sounds like minor clock speed gains are all we have to look forward to. And let's be honest here, in a 45 watt part, often these clock speed gains are irrelevant for actually improving performance. We've seen a few times now that when Intel has bumped up their clocks on paper between 14 nanometer generations, there isn't much, if any, of a real world performance improvement as these chips often have to clock a lot less than their rated boost speeds to keep within the 45 watt power limit. We might get a small gain in low thread count applications, but if clock speeds are the only gains, I can't see multi-threaded tasks improving by all that much. As for launch timeframes, Intel has come out and said that these parts will launch in the first quarter of the year. We've been hearing for months now that Comet Lake should be available around March to April, so I guess this narrows it down a bit to a March launch timeframe. I think we should expect Comet Lake S for the desktop around then too, although clearly Intel isn't ready to talk about that yet. Intel also revealed some very early details on Tiger Lake, which is their next generation low power series built on a new refinement to their 10 nanometer node. These chips are expected to come out in 2020, although much later in the year. They will bring XE graphics with int 8 support for AI, power limits up to 25 watts, we will get Thunderbolt 4, double digit performance gains gen on gen, and a huge leap in graphics performance. Seems like a pretty optimistic set of statements with very little other information to back it up, no benchmarks or anything like that, but we'll see how this progresses later in the year when they're willing to talk more about it. We also got a brief look at Intel's DG1 graphics, which is a discrete mobile GPU based on their XE architecture. They demoed a game briefly, and that was basically it. They've also shown XE running Destiny 2 at 1080p on the show floor, but very little other info to go on, and it seems like discrete desktop XE graphics is, well, ages away. Perhaps the most interesting news from Intel is their new Ghost Canyon NUC platform, which is their yeah, coolest NUC design yet and seems to be gathering a lot of interest from partners. Essentially, this is a socketable computer. It's a PCIe board with a CPU, chipset, and RAM on it, plus I.O. that fits into a compact package. This is then plugged into a board with two PCIe slots, one for the CPU part and one for the GPU. Essentially, the CPU's PCIe connection is just being routed out to the PCIe slot for the GPU, but it's done in this neat model modular way that simplifies the building process for, I guess, novice PC builders. Then the NUC chassis also features a PSU to power everything. Intel's own Ghost Canyon design is very compact as just a five liter chassis, which supports GPUs up to eight inches in length. But there are other systems out there that are using the same sort of base platform, such as Razer's Tomahawk, that's a bit larger and supports full length GPUs. I'm sure there are several others that have been announced as well, but these are the main ones that seem to be capturing the most interest. Right now, the CPU card is using Intel's ninth generation H series processors. You can get up to an eight core Core i9 9980HK, but it will be limited to just 45 watts. And the cooling for this chip is definitely laptop style, so it won't be incredible and could also be reasonably loud. Inside the module is also two sodium slots and two M.2 slots. I think the idea here is that entire modules will be sold. Intel says a newer version will come to market later, presumably supporting 10th gen chips. And people who buy these compact systems can just swap out an old module for a new one, which could be great for those that want something compact and don't have much experience building PCs. And those with just a bit of experience 
experience should be able to swap out RAM and storage without replacing the entire card, only swapping out the card when they want a new CPU. This really takes the upgradability of these NUC designs to the next level, as previously, if you wanted to perform a CPU upgrade, you'd basically have to buy an entirely new chassis. With this design, yeah, you still need to replace the motherboard and CPU at once, but you should be able to keep your chassis and PSU. Hopefully this makes the platform a bit cheaper. Now for some NVIDIA stuff, starting with their 360Hz G-Sync monitor they've been working on with ASUS. Not much information has been shared about this panel yet other than it's a 24.5 inch panel at 1080p with G-Sync support. We don't have a panel type yet, I would guess it's a TN to hit those sorts of speeds. But really the big news here is pushing up to 360 hertz for the first time. Now this isn't going to be a monitor for everyone, most people don't even get the benefits of today's 240 hertz displays. What this will be useful for is high-end competitive gaming and professional gamers that need every slight advantage they can get. Nvidia has some research showing pro gamers were 4 percentage points better at flick shots using a 360Hz monitor over 240Hz, which is a significant difference for those gamers, but more of a diminishing return situation for casuals. Love to see display hardware getting pushed to the limits like this, obviously if you do want one of these, you'll need a very powerful PC to push out frames that fast. Hoping to get more information on this one soon, there's no word on pricing or release date, and I suspect it could be a while before we see this on the market. Both Nvidia and ASUS have a history of announcing these sorts of revolutionary new displays displays years before they come out. Hopefully this launches sooner than that, but yeah, we'll see. Nvidia also released a game-ready driver at CES, which actually isn't game-ready for any particular game, but does come with some interesting feature additions. The biggest one is a frame rate cap implemented at the driver level, which has been the biggest requested feature and really is, it's quite amazing that this hasn't been added earlier since AMD has had this sort of feature for a while now. Nvidia says this feature can be used either to save GPU power if used in conjunction with the optimal power power management mode, or to reduce latency if used with the maximum performance power management mode. It's also very handy for those with adaptive sync displays. If you want the best experience in terms of latency, tearing, all that sort of thing, you should try capping the frame rate to slightly below your monitor's maximum refresh rate. This new driver also introduces variable rate super sampling for VR games, which can super sample the center area of the screen while rendering the outer areas at a normal rate. This allows for better quality in the area of the screen where your eyes can resolve the most detail, while keeping the periphery areas at a normal quality where you can't tell as much. There's a few other features here too, like improvements to sharpening and filters. And one last story to finish out this episode of News Corner, we have a bit more information on Thunderbolt 4, courtesy of Tom's Hardware. You might remember back when I was talking about Tiger Lake, that one of its features would be support for Thunderbolt 4, which is exciting as, yeah, we haven't seen any updates to Thunderbolt since version 3 launched in 2015. But unfortunately, before you get too excited, Thunderbolt 4 is shaping up as a rather boring update. You see, Intel was being perhaps a bit misleading with its slide saying Thunderbolt 4 would offer four times the throughput of USB 3. That's because the USB 3 version they're referencing here is USB 3.1, aka USB 3.2 Gen 2, at 10 gigabits per second, not the latest USB 3.2 Gen 2 2x2 at 20 gigabits per second. So this means that Thunderbolt 4, with four times the throughput, still offers the same 40 gigabits per second as Thunderbolt 3, meaning there's no real upgrade here over Thunderbolt 3 or USB 4, which will provide the same 40 gigabits per second and is based on Thunderbolt 3 technology. If Intel were instead referring to USB 3.2 Gen 2x2 here, then Thunderbolt 4 would have 80 gigabits per second of bandwidth. But no, same sort of bandwidth we're getting here. In fact, Tom spoke to an industry source who said it's basically just a rebranding of Thunderbolt 3, perhaps to make it seem new when Intel doesn't have anything else to offer with their new products. Apparently, Thunderbolt 4 will signify that the Thunderbolt 3 and USB 4 connections have been certified by Intel, whatever that means. Intel has also said that Thunderbolt 4 adds the latest Thunderbolt innovations, but without adding any bandwidth. It is unclear what that means, and we can expect more information about that in the future, of course. And that's it for this CES News Roundup. We'll have more stuff later in the week. We'll go over some of the other announcements of stuff like all those monitors that have come out. Uh, there's lots of stuff to sort through, and I only want to give you guys the actual interesting stuff rather than waves of products that no one really cares about. So yeah, subscribe for some of the rest of our CES coverage and I guess our reviews, which will be coming back into regular programming in just a little bit. What else? Uh, well, I've already said to subscribe. I guess you can support us through the usual places like our Patreon page and through our merch store. Links to that are in the description below. And yeah, I'll catch you in the next one. <laughs>